Halloween has long since lost its teeth as a night of fear. Celtic pagans and Western Christians alike have traditionally respected the night as time to honour the dead. Many believe that this was the night that those who had departed the world of the living, whilst the Celts might have put out offerings and Christians may have held vigils, praying aloud for the souls of the dead, ideas surfaced that this was also the night that evil was abroad. One particular Halloween in 1828, a certain crime took place that some might have seen as horrifying proof that this had been the case. Edinburgh, Scotland's capital, is one of the most enthusiastic supporters of this celebration in the world. However, the crowded streets and closes of 19th century Old Reekie, the poorer neighbourhood of Edinburgh, wasn't the most inviting of places, even on nights that did not come under the shadow of superstition. Poor sanitation and overcrowding had helped create a squalid environment of iniquity. With no clean drinking water, most individuals, rich or poor alike, worked through the day at some level of intoxication. One could only imagine the standards of alcohol that addled the minds of the communities that did their best to scrape a living around areas like Westport, where our story is located, and where a particular form of darkness fell. Human ghouls stalked these streets for one terrifying year. Like this grisly figure of fantasy, these wretched villains had no respect for the dead. They might not have been literal cannibals, but they were no lesser parasites on humanity. Margaret Doherty, who sometimes went by her maiden name Campbell, and sometimes was known as Mary, or Maggie, was a poor Irish immigrant from Donegal. She lived in Glasgow, but had travelled down to Edinburgh in search of her son Michael. Her search had not been fruitful, and she hadn't thought her plans through. She was now destitute in a totally foreign city. On the morning of the 31st of October, Mrs Doherty entered Rhymer's grocery shop, begging for money. She hadn't eaten that morning and was at a loss. However, it appeared that her prayers had been answered, when who should she meet but a friendly fellow Irish immigrant willing to buy her a wee dram. The neat little man was fairly popular in the area and known for dancing a good jig when in the right mood. He was a regular at Rhymer's, where amongst other things customers could purchase a mouthful of whiskey to help embolden them to the rest of the day. This suited this particular customer well, especially as it allowed him to meet people new to the area. Upon hearing the unfortunate woman's name and that she hailed from Innes Hohen in Donegal, the new friend exclaimed that Doherty was also his mother's name and, wouldn't you know it, she also came from Innes Hohen. My, they must be related. And that was a cause for celebration. The man invited her back to his home, actually his cousin's lodging house. With a new guest installed with porridge and drink and chatting with his girlfriend Helen Nellie McDougall, the man said he was going out to buy some more whiskey for the party tonight. It must have appeared to Mrs Doherty that life had finally cut her a very welcome break for now. The man's name was William Burke. Described by his contemporaries as an amiable fellow, he was a sociable dancer and singer. Born near Strabane in the very west of County Tyrone, part of the province of Ulster in the north of Ireland, he left his wife and two children in Ulster to be one of many immigrants who had flooded into Edinburgh to work on the new Union Canal. After that employment had ceased, he'd become a hawker with Nellie and they sold second-hand clothes to the poverty-stricken inhabitants of Westport. Burke soon became a cobbler by trade, mending old discarded boots to sell and was known for entertaining clients with his singing and dancing. He was also very used to opening up his home to guests. Often these people were the poorest of the poor. Good to his word, William Burke went back to Rhymer's to get the whisky. Here he met up with his friend, another Irish immigrant, William Hare. Whereas Burke was known for his friendliness, Hare was a surly street thug, mean with his money and quick to fight. Unlike the affectionate relationship shared by Burke and Nellie, Hare's girlfriend was rarely seen without bruises on her face. Nevertheless, the two Williams had known each other for almost a year and shared lodgings for a while at Tanner's Close, where they began the enterprise that would ensure their names in infamy. William Hare was born in Newry and worked as a farm labourer, like Burke, he had emigrated to work on the Union Canal. He then found work as a labourer by a man named Logue, who had also given him lodgings at his tenement house in Tanner's Close. Hare demonstrating the sort of loyalty and friendship that would be associated with his character, repaid his new boss and landlord by wooing the man's wife, Margaret Lucky Laird. This got him thrown out, 
but he was soon back after Logue died in 1826 and moved in with Lucky, soon installing himself as the new landlord by 1827. Conditions at Hare's boarding house in Tanner's Close were as terrible as any other in Edinburgh's old town, contrasting dramatically with the huge developments, advances and prosperity of the city's new town, which was celebrating a golden age as one of the leading cultural centres of Europe. South of the Great Castle, matters could not have been more different. Their overcrowded districts of slung tenement buildings, often referred to as lands, were anyone's definition of filth. In his book, Burke and Hare, Year of the Ghouls, Bill Bailey relies heavily on primary sources to describe the scene. Quote, Filthy winding staircases called turnpike stairs led from squalid yards and alleys to apartments where washing hung out of windows during daylight hours and human and other refuse was tipped out of them at night. Stinking had been the adjective commonly used by writers and visitors to describe old Edinburgh for centuries. Neither the grey houses nor the grey streets had drains. Slum dwellers obliterated by all consciousness of their miserable plight by means of heavy drinking. Pallid and emaciated inhabitants of the poorer quarters shuffled along dingy alleyways, dodging the excrement of dogs and the vomit of drunks, keeping a wary ear open for the brief incantation, Gardiloo, signalling the ritual dowsing of piss and garbage from above. End quote. Tanner's Close had its own distinctive layer of odour to add to the smoke constantly being pumped out by the congestion of chimneys and the lack of drainage. The stench of putrefying animal corpses and hides from the tanneries that gave the close its name. Finally, add into the regular Irish custom of wakes, whereby a corpse of a family member would be left in a home until enough money had been collected for the funeral, and the stage was set for the worst humanity to take advantage of life's most unfortunate. With a considerable influx of poor immigrant labourers brought in by huge endeavours like the Union Canal, the already overpopulated Old Town saw lodging houses packed to the roofs with desperate people. Subletting became a very common practice, with labourers frequently renting a bed and then letting half the bed space to another. These beds were often little more than straw that had previously been used for animals. Old Logue's land had eight beds, and often these beds slept up to three individuals. At threepence a night, Hare had been able to give up most of his regular work although his addiction to alcohol meant that he still had to make ends meet with the odd bit of labour here and there. And then there was the other, much more lucrative activity he did with Burke. The two had met in 1827 after Hare had taken over Logue's land. Burke and Nellie had become acquainted with Lucky whilst out drinking. Learning the two were seeking lodgings, Lucky had encouraged them to stay at Tanner's Close. There's another account that states Burke and Nellie first met Hare whilst working on the harvest in Pennycook in Midlothian, Regardless of the circumstances of their first meeting, it wasn't long before the two embarked upon their dark business together. A year later, and a lot had happened. This had included the two briefly falling out, leading to Burke and Nellie moving out to live in with Burke's cousin and her husband, John Brogan, two streets away. The spat hadn't lasted too long, they both liked the easy money their shared work provided. With Mrs Doherty secured at Brogan's house, Burke confirmed to Hare, in hushed tones, that he... Quote, had a good shot for the doctors, end quote. A shot was a slang term used by the burgeoning trade of body snatchers for a corpse. A few who lived in and around the Westport district suspected that the pair were in this particular business. Body snatching had grown from the increased need and desire to train larger numbers of surgeons. Since the Napoleonic Wars, where surgeons had been forced to progress in their skills, leaps in surgical science had been made and more students wished to pursue this profession. However, anatomy classes such as those run in Surgeon Square, Edinburgh, by the likes of Alexander Monroe of the famous Monroe Medical Dynasty, or his rival, Robert Knox, were hampered in their supply of bodies by certain religious laws in place. Surgeons were only permitted the corpses of unclaimed orphans, suicide victims and executed criminals. Having actual human cadavers to dissect were a big selling point for these lessons and were expected by the attending students. This created the impetus and high demand for the service provided by the resurrectionists. The new town looked to the old to do their dirty work. Body snatching wasn't technically illegal, as no one could legally own a corpse. Provided the body was delivered naked, no crime was committed when a surgeon or his assistant paid a resurrection man. 
Dr Knox filled his two-a-day lectures with the promise of a fresh subject to demonstrate on every time. Gangs of criminals robbed very recent graves to supply the medical hospitals of Edinburgh and London. Listeners of this particular podcast might be interested in the fact that one notorious London body snatcher was also a former boxer and a well-known boxing promoter called Ben Crouch, who was once dubbed King of the Resurrectionists for monopolising his local trade by heading the Borough Gang. He was noted for his poxmark face, his dandy clothes and love of gold rings that he wore like knuckle dusters. Amongst his gang members was another skilled boxer, Jack Harnett, who lost a match to Crouch after receiving a punch to his previously injured jaw. In 1817, the same year Burke and Hare's work on the Union Canal ceased, Crouch moved on from London body snatching for anatomy lectures to specialising in selling teeth he and Harnett retrieved from battlefields. This grisly work was carried out as they worked as licensed sutlers, although the fortune Crouch made largely came from the valuable jewellery he wasn't permitted to take from the fallen soldiers. He invested these funds in building a hotel in Margate that began turning a tidy profit before Crouch's reputation leaked out and he was forced to sell the building at a sizeable loss. He ended up destitute, his body found in the top room of a public house in Tower Hill. A public house called Ben Crouch's once traded off his ghoulish story in Regent Street, London. Although Burke and Hare's names would become synonymous with the profession of body snatching, this wasn't their real business. At best, it was a cover believed by their neighbours and at worst, it was a useful lie shared by those who paid them. The two had begun working together barely a month after Burke and Nellie had moved into Hare's lodgings. A tenant of Hare's, an old soldier called Donald, had died whilst owing £4 back rent. Although both men would later lay the main portion of blame for the crimes on the other, it is likely that Burke came up with a plan to pack Donald's coffin with bark chippings while secreting away the body for sale at Surgeon Square to recoup Hare's loss. Being the far better diplomat and salesman, it seems likely he would have done the talking when it came to handing the corpse over. He'd seen a solution opportunity that not only provided the money owing to Hare, but produced a tidy profit they could both comfortably share. After making an easy trade with Dr Knox, the corpse being fresher than even the newly buried, the two had secured a regular buyer and hit upon a new business venture. On their first transaction, Burke and Hare had been able to circumvent all the obstacles typically faced by resurrection men. They'd cut out undertakers, grave diggers, mort safes and night watchmen by snatching a body before it even made it to the cemetery. However, the next time they would visit Knox with a body, the wretched pair would have expediated their process further still and moved from this single act of body snatching to murder. One of Hare's lodgers, a miller called Joseph, had fallen ill with a fever and the odious pair reconciled themselves with the excuse that a potentially infectious person should be removed from the house. After plying Joseph with enough drink that he was virtually unconscious, one of the two put a pillow over his face whilst the other lay across his body to hold him still. This resulted in yet another easy transaction. It wasn't long before an unnamed English match seller fell ill from jaundice whilst renting a bed at Hare's. Lucky was worrying that, yet again, an infectious tenant would scare off future lodgers. Another solution opportunity presented itself and his corpse would number as the second murder victim of the Grizzly too. However, as eager to make easy money as they were at spending it away on drink, Burke and Hare weren't going to wait around for another tenant to fall ill. Abigail Simpson was an elderly woman who lived a few miles away but regularly walked into Edinburgh to collect charity for her ex-employer and hawk meagre goods such as salt in the streets. Hare, seeing another opportunity, took her to Tanner's Close. He and Burke then drank with her until she was too intoxicated to go home. The heavy drinking continued to the next morning and the two men made the decision to act whilst poor Miss Simpson was insensible. Yet another smooth transaction with Knox, who apparently remarked on its freshness, emboldened the two to continue their murderous work. Their next victim almost cut their evil career short. Mary Patterson, by all accounts, was a poor but strikingly beautiful girl who had grown up in Glasgow, but travelled like many to Edinburgh in search of work. She's often described as being in her late teens at the time of her death. She might have still been connected to the Edinburgh Magdalen Asylum, a notoriously strict Catholic halfway house that was often used as a refuge and a reformatory to stop poor women from falling into a life of crime. 
Prior to entering the institute, Mary had apparently been made pregnant by a medical student who, already being engaged, immediately broke off the relationship. She had befriended fellow Glaswegian Nellie McDougall and lodged with her and William Burke. The baby was delivered full term before being put into the care of a friend and Mary had entered the Magdalen Institute. One Wednesday morning on the 9th of April, Mary and her friend of similar age, Janet Brown, entered William Swanston's shop on Canongate when who should they meet there drinking rum and bitters but William Burke. The previous night, Mary and Janet had spent the night at Canongate Watch House for disturbing the peace. Despite the efforts of the Magdalen House, it would appear that Mary had fallen on bad times. Mary and Janet had been lodging at the houses of two women it was rumoured were madams. Burke, presumably recognising Mary, approached them, bought them drinks and invited them back to continue the merriment at his elder brother Constantine's place at Gibbs Close, off Canongate. They agreed. Janet Brown was to escape a murderous end thanks to jealous Nellie McDougall bursting in on the partying. It would appear she had little sympathy for her old friend Mary and was more concerned about Burke's other intentions. After a violent row broke out between the couple, Janet was escorted out onto the street. Meanwhile, Mary Patterson lay in a drunken stupor. Hair was fetched and the poor tragic girl's life was ended. Janet Brown would return later that night asking after her friend and probably just avoiding getting killed when she agreed to drink with Hare in a local pub. Fortunately, the owner of the houses where the two girls lodged sent a servant to retrieve Janet. As Burke and Hare carried Mary in a tea chest to Surgeon Square, they were accompanied by a chorus of schoolboys chanting, They're carrying a corpse. They're carrying a corpse. Upon arrival, they were questioned by a medical student called William Ferguson about how they came by the body. Burke concocted a tale about an old woman selling them it after the unfortunate girl had drunk herself to death. Ferguson had met Mary before. Indeed, she was an attractive girl and fairly well known in the area. Most accounts state that at least one of the students recognised Mary. Janet Brown always strenuously denied claims that Mary was a prostitute but it didn't stop journalists from using the unfounded story as the basis for a perverse morality tale. Later, several dramas inspired by the Burke and Hare story cast Mary as a tragic streetwalker and added in her previous ill-fated romance with a medical student as a class-conscious plot element. Other students present at the delivery remarked that her body was still warm. Days later, Burke got into an argument with an employee of Robert Knox David Patterson, no relation, who questioned how he obtained these fresh corpses. Burke rebuked him and warned that he should have words with Dr Knox. That ended the matter for the time being. Mary Patterson's body was pickled and shown off by Knox as an example of the perfect human form for at least three months. Knox even invited the artist John Oliphant to create a line drawing of Mary's corpse, which he posed as Venus. This last aspect of the story seems particularly macabre and in bad taste, even before knowledge of her murder was revealed. An almost necrophiliac interest in viewing Mary's body seems to have taken place at Knox's lectures. There's an apophrical tale that the famous surgeon Robert Liston, known for his charitable interest in the underclasses, also recognised Mary. The story goes that he punched Knox for displaying the corpse in such a cavalier manner, ensuring that her remains were respectfully buried. There's no evidence to support this story, however the entire sorry affair highlights the scary bystander aspects that allow these crimes to continue. Often, when investigators trace back crimes of neglect and abuse, they draw elaborate webs of accountability that reveal large numbers of individuals whose actions could have prevented a tragedy. Such a vast web of passive bystanders can be drawn around the crimes of Burke and Hare, and their string of murders could have stopped with Mary Patterson. <laughs> 
Instead, Janet Brown kept looking for her friend, but she was shooed away by Burke's brother, who claimed he had no idea where Mary had gone. An atmosphere of willful ignorance and apathy within her own community and the community of those who were supposedly training to preserve lives had allowed a young, well-known and well-liked teenager to be consumed by both the ghouls of the lower and higher levels of Edinburgh society. Unfortunately, all these near misses with Mary Patterson did not dissuade Burke and Hare from continuing their business, nor did it get them caught. If anything, it brought the family business closer together and a less reckless operation was executed to procure future shots. The greed of money encouraged by the eager demand of their payer eased whatever moral scruples they may have possessed, and intoxication steeled them to their vile work. They preyed on the homeless, the weak and the destitute. They even killed a grandmother and her mute grandson on the same night. Sometimes the victims happened upon Tanner's Close. However, for the most part, Burke and Hare hunted their various local haunts. They would take notice of individuals who wouldn't be missed. This wasn't difficult to do, even for two perpetually drunk men. Being both overpopulated and full of transient beggars, it was fairly easy to lose track of people in Westport. Once their mark had been selected, either man would turn on the charm and generosity by buying the unfortunate individual drinks. This served a dual purpose. It created trust, often feeding an addiction shared by many people of the time, and helped make the person more malleable to the men's intentions. They would then lure their prey back to the secluded room to be suffocated by pinching the victim's nose and clamping a hand over the victim's mouth. The practice would become known as burking after the discovery of their crime. A few of the victims remain nameless to this day, but occasionally the odd person came looking for them, and they even gained a degree of notoriety before the scandalous murders came to the attention of the authorities. In one tragic case, the daughter of an elderly prostitute killed by Burke and Hare attempted to track her mother down, but ended up being murdered by Burke. Eventually, Burke and Hare had their aforementioned falling out when Hare carried out a complete operation and transaction whilst Burke was away. Burke moved in with his cousin two streets away. Again, Hare demonstrated the lack of honour he possessed for anyone and served as a foreshadowing of how he would behave when the murders were discovered. When the two made up and resumed business, the caution they and their accomplices had shown following Mary Patterson's murder seemed to have been forgotten. The 15th victim was no transient or unfamiliar figure. James Darth Jamie Wilson was a well-known young local eccentric. He enjoyed wandering the streets much to the concern of his mother and sister who looked after him. No matter the weather, he could be seen without a hat on his head or shoes on his feet. It had been stated that his feet were deformed and this was the reason why he wouldn't wear shoes. He also had an odd halting gait. Despite his nickname, Darth Jamie might have been a savant. Apparently, he never begged but entertained people for money, food and snuff, which he was particularly fond of, by performing incredible calculations on the spot. His main piece was being able to match the day of the week correctly with any given date. He was known to be incredibly gentle-natured. To many in Westport, he was a friendly face who entertained the local children with silly stories and was often the butt of their teasing and horseplay. These traits, along with the perpetual look of confusion on his face, were possibly what inspired Lucky to set him up at Tanner's Close before going to Rymer's to buy some butter and give Burke a light stamp on his foot, her signal that a shot had been selected. Darth Jamie was looking for his mother and was used to the kindness of locals. Getting him to Tanner's Close wasn't a problem. However, despite his obvious susceptibility, he was not the usual type of victim that Burke and Hare selected. Lucky had simply took him for a lost half-wit that would not be missed and easily drunk into unconsciousness before being easily dispatched. Instead, he was even more well-known than Mary Patterson and, unlike many locals, did not enjoy drinking to excess. He preferred snuff. He was also now very anxious about seeing his mother, who had been assured by Lucky would be there immediately. Burke and Hare led Jamie into the room that Burke used to live in before the fallout, and Lucky locked the door behind them, sliding the key underneath. Jamie eventually lay down on the bed, but refused more whiskey. Seeing no other option if they were going to follow through with the plan, the ghouls pounced on him and began their well-honed suffocation procedure. The two had overestimated their abilities, or underestimated Jamie's, or both. Not being fully intoxicated and still a young man, no matter how disabled, he put up a spirited fight against both of these attackers, possibly biting Burke in the testicles until he was eventually suffocated. However, this would be the least of the inconveniences suffered by the murderers as Darth Jamie Wilson would strike back from the grave. <laughs> 
For the time being, the immediate problems were business-related. Lucky subsequently fell out with Burke when he refused to pay her anything out of his share of the money they received from Knox. Previously, she'd received a pound for the use of her lodgings, but Burke reasoned that he no longer lived there. The subsequent row between the Burks and the Hares lasted for three weeks. Again, like Patterson, Jamie was recognised by the students. Knox dismissed this claim, but had the body's head and distinctive feet severed and destroyed. On the subject of disposal, you might recall that the normal procedure for body snatchers was to discard their corpses' clothes, as they could be arrested for theft. However, it would appear that Burke and Hare didn't always do this with their victims. Hey, they'd opted for murder. Why get shy when it comes to thievery? In the case of Darth Jamie, Hare kept the unfortunate man's snuffbox and his clothes were distributed amongst Constantine Burke's children. By this stage, Burke and Hare must have thought themselves untouchable. They were operating in circles of apathy and or connivance, be they Burke's family, their own common-law wives, their neighbours or the surgery where they sold their corpses. Halloween would just be another day and night of grim business as usual. Poor old Mrs Doherty was easily convinced to drink herself into a stupor as she celebrated with her newly found relative. As others feared the imaginary spectral evil that walked outside, Mrs Doherty was totally unaware of the very real evil she danced with on that fateful night. This was despite her talking with Burke's next-door neighbours, the Conaways, who insisted that Burke was not a Doherty. Various people saw the perpetually drunk Mrs Doherty in the presence of either Burke or Hare that day, including Burke's cousin Brogan and another neighbour, Mrs Law. Throughout the day, Burke and Hare manoeuvred people out of the way and Mrs Doherty into position to have their private party, where they would dance with their women and Mrs Doherty would sing songs of the old country. Such merriment would cease as the night wore on, The Conaways would later report they heard the noise of scuffling and fighting in the middle of the night, but this was not unusual when it came to Burke and Hare. A nearby grocer would later say that he heard a woman's voice briefly scream, For God's sake, get the police! There's murder here! But in the end, it was Burke's tenants, the Greys, who would break the web of bystanders and bring about the demise of Edinburgh's most infamous murderers. This particular family had been put up at Tanner's Close in order to allow Mrs Doherty to have her party at Burke's lodgings. They would return twice to their original dwelling. The first time, they would see Burke behaving in a strange fashion in the presence of Nellie McDougall, Mrs Conaway, Mrs Law and his young cousin Brogan. He was splashing whiskey all over the room, particularly over the bed in his room and the straw underneath on the pretense that he wanted the bottle empty so he could get some more. Mrs Gray had left some of her child's clothes at Burke's house when they had been hastily moved the previous day. They were missing a stocking and Mrs Gray went to look at the foot of the bed where there was straw. Burke quickly admonished her to keep out of there. Mrs Gray, Mrs Conaway and Mrs Law had all asked Nellie McDougall about what had happened to the little lady that they had been entertaining all day and night. Nellie replied that the woman had become too familiar with Burke and that she had, quote, kicked the damn bitch's backside out the door, end quote. Once again, Burke's residence would be a busy place on All Saints Day. Eventually, Burke would leave to discuss this latest transaction with Robert Knox. It was when he had left without anyone to guard the bed that the Greys returned. Suspicious of his earlier behaviour, Mrs Gray looked under the bed and made a gruesome discovery. She first uncovered an arm before being met with the body of Margaret Doherty, stripped and ready for delivery, staring up at them with blood still on her face. Mr and Mrs Gray would meet with Nellie McDougall after leaving the lodging to discuss the presence of the corpse. Nellie begged the couple to say nothing and offered them hush money. As poor as they were, the Greys were having none of it. As the quarrel made it out onto the street, a similarly concerned and desperate lucky lair joined in with the begging. The Greys lost them in a public house before Mr Gray informed the police and Mrs Gray informed Mrs Conaway, who agreed to put them up. Mr Conaway would tell Burke that there was gossip he had killed Mrs Doherty. Burke laughed it off. He'd already bought a tea chest from Rymers, a common form of transport he and Hare used for corpses, and deposited Mrs Doherty's corpse with David Patterson at Knox's premises. Burke's lodgings were inspected by Sergeant John Fisher with Mr Gray where blood was found on the straw. The body was found, still in the tea chest in Knox's cellar. Two days later, the two wretched murderers were arrested, ensuring a macabre theatre of their vile lives. Shockingly, and despite the amount of witnesses, authorities feared there was not enough evidence to convict. 
Much of this was down to concerns about what would be uncovered in the medical profession. However, public outrage was now in full force. The revelation that the likes of Darth Jamie Wilson had been a victim of the two killers had aroused a tremendous amount of rage. Meanwhile, various pretty dreadful poems and ballads were created in honour of this very innocent victim, some of which made the papers. Burke and Hare got their own children's rhyme that features the location of the close, labels Burke the butcher, Hare the thief, and knocks as, quote, the old boy who buys the beef, end quote. In the end, a deal was put before William Hare to turn King's evidence. This gave him immunity from prosecution in return for providing evidence that would see his partner in crime hung. Helen Nellie McDougall's case was not proven, and she was constantly having to escape vengeful mobs wherever she went in Scotland. Finding it hard to cope with her protection, Newcastle police escorted her to the border of Durham, where she disappeared from history. All other members of Burke's family escaped arrest. Maggie Lucky Laird was separated from Hare when no case was put against her. Like Nellie, she was also pursued by angry mobs wherever she went, despite holding a child in her arms and had to be constantly put into protective custody. Her last known proven whereabouts was on the 16th of February, as she boarded the Finn Gale from Greenock to Belfast. William Hare escaped a private prosecution from Darth Jamie Wilson's family. He had been in prison for months for his own protection, and in case the family of Mary Doherty were to launch their own private case against him. In the end, even a civil action for damages could not be made, as by then he owned nothing and was technically homeless. His protected escort across the country under the guise of Mr Black resulted in two riots occurring in Dumfries, the first when the coach reached the King's Arms and the second at the county jail, where Hare had been put for his own protection. He was smuggled out during the early morning hours and escorted to the English border. The last official sighting of the man was in Carlisle. Various stories appeared in the press that Hare had been lynched in Londonderry, La Ireland, or New York, USA, or had become a farmer in Ontario, Canada, or a convict transported to Australia. The most popular and persistent story popularised by Attlee's famous Trials of the Century was a Victorian story that merged wishful retributive thinking with bogeyman myth-making. The tale goes that whilst working as a labourer, his fellow workmen discovered his identity and blinded him with quicklime. By the 1870s, a blind beggar accompanied by a dog said to be William Hare was regularly seen walking the streets of London. The poor man was actually a Thomas Ware who proved his identity in court, but the story stuck and has since been immortalised in both fiction and true crime books as the fitting end for the cold-hearted murderer. Dr Robert Knox's career was far from finished. His lectures continued to be very well attended to the point that he moved halls to accommodate larger audiences. However, this was not to last. He received a lot of public criticism and there was much jeering from outside his lectures, but he never missed a single session. He was harried to resign certain positions such as Army Commission and Curator of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh Museum. Despite declarations that investigations be made into his dealing with Burke and Hare, no charges were ever brought against him. The rest of his career was rocky. He was eventually expelled from the Royal Society of Edinburgh for falsifying a student's certificate. His elitist beliefs in ethnology marred much of his reputation, and it's been argued that this is what allowed him to turn a blind eye to the methods used by his corpse suppliers. Certainly, Knox continued to purchase cadavers from notorious body snatchers. He worked in the Free Cancer Hospital in London until his death. William Burke was tried and convicted on Christmas Day 1828, giving the Edinburgh general public the present they all wanted. On Wednesday the 28th of January, he was hung amidst cries of Burke him, an expression that has since become slang for his method of murder, and bring out hair, and bring out Knox. Burke's execution was watched by hundreds and windows of nearby buildings were sold to spectators. Amongst them was the Scottish literary giant Sir Walter Scott, who even had to share his window, such was the demand. Scott never wrote publicly about the crimes, but he revealed a lot in his correspondence, particularly in his condemnation of Knox. In accordance with judges' orders, Burke was publicly dissected by Professor Monroe, Knox's arch-rival surgeon lecturer. His theatre was packed to such a degree that police had to be called in to restore order. There were two public viewings of the corpse after the dissection, whereby over 27,000 people filed through the college. The body was then stripped of flesh, 
and the skeleton was preserved for display in the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh University, where it can still be viewed today. Burke's skin was also preserved and made into various gruesome souvenirs. The Edinburgh Police Museum has a matchbox made from Burke's skin on display. Surgeon's Hall, off-site to the general public, has a pocketbook bound in Burke's skin. Apparently even Charles Dickens had a bookmark made from Burke's skin. Burke and Hare's crimes did not immediately bring about a change in medical law, allowing surgeons a wider supply of corpses that put body snatchers out of business. In fact, the most obvious influence their crimes had, apart from the copious amount of tabloid stories, essays and fiction it inspired, is the copycat killings that began to take place. Seventy years prior to the case of Burke and Hare, Helen Torrance and Jean Waldy murdered an eight- or nine-year-old boy, John Dallas, to sell to Edinburgh's medical students. After Burke and Hare's crimes were made public, Bethnal Green suffered the villainy of the London Burkers who had modelled their murdering business on the ghouls of Westport. These crimes finally helped put through the Anatomy Act and body snatching became an extinct crime in Britain. Burke and Hare might seem like a story of an archaic series of crimes confined to a different era, but there's plenty within the story that we can apply to modern self-protection learning. Firstly, there's the modus operandi. Burke and Hare generally acquire their victims by targeting those they perceive to be vulnerable and alone. Target hardening is a vital part of self-protection training. This is why attitude must be taught first in a person's personal security training before anything else can be rationally confirmed to be effective. There's no point in being aware if you don't have the attitude to act upon that awareness. A hardened target is visibly alert to his or her surroundings and acts in a purposeful manner. Quite simply, switch on to your environment especially if something doesn't feel right or you feel you're in an unfamiliar setting. For example, if you need to ask for directions, do so in a confident manner and keep your mobile phone out of sight. Situational awareness can be defined by people, places, hazards, changes and context. There has long been fears and discussions behind the spiking of drinks used by criminals, usually rapists, to render their victims defenceless. Drugs like rohypnol, ketamine and GHB have earned a terrifying reputation. However, the most common drug used by criminals to take down a victim's defences is alcohol. Burke and Hare knew this, and they used it both to give themselves Dutch courage and as a means to incapacitate their targets. Drinking to excess is not smart from a self-protection point of view. There really is no other way around this one. Secondly, we come to a culture that allows criminals like Burke and Hare to thrive. They were opportunists. They are often portrayed as cunning villains, but they spent most of their time being drunk and relied a lot upon sheer temerity to get away with their crimes. Looking at the huge mistakes they made and their general recklessness, I don't think there is a lot to support the argument that they had an extraordinary criminal ability. They were cowardly, generally lazy and often complacent. Knowing that possessing the clothes of victims was the only way body snatchers could be arrested and also that the possessions of clothes of victims that others were now looking for demonstrates how stupid they were in their actions. It's this sort of confidence that allows criminals to make short work of their naive and inexperienced prey. They also take advantage of a culture of acceptance and denial. In safeguarding courses we're taught about the links in a chain that allow abuses to victims to continue unheeded. In the case of domestic abuse, an individual is abused in their home by people they trust. The visible signs may be seen at work or school if the victim is a child and friends might note changes in their personality or distinctively unusual behaviours. Eventually, should the crime be uncovered, an entire series of links are put together that present a chain of responsible people that should have acted sooner. The aforementioned bystander web we covered earlier. Often, when we read shocking true crime stories, we're surprised by how many different people either didn't notice that there was something terribly wrong or turned a blind eye for whatever reason. Burke and Hare's actual physical method is virtually outmoded, but it still does happen from time to time. During their day, it was a simple way to kill an individual whilst not leaving any obvious signs of violence. This method would not work with today's forensic scientists. Smothering in general has earned an inflated reputation throughout the annals of criminal history. For example, according to the 1st century Roman historian Tacitus, the infamous Emperor Caligula had his predecessor Tiberius smothered by the prefect of the Praetorian Guard. The act of burking by closing off a victim's mouth and nose is thought to be so effective by many that we see victims in fiction dying this way by accident as someone merely tries to keep them quiet. It's also a defence that's been ineffectively put forward by some murderers. 
However, given the description provided for Darth Jamie's end and the signs on Mary Doherty's corpse, it would appear that the likes of Robert Knox really weren't paying a lot of attention to how the victims had died. Nevertheless, if we look at this in the abstract, suffocation is not an uncommon method of killing, and being attacked by more than one person is certainly a scenario worth factoring into regular training. This also brings us to ground fighting. If a fight does go to the ground, a serious student of self-protection needs to know how to move against a resisting opponent when they're down. Furthermore, they need to know how to move against someone compressing their chest and blocking their airways as they are likely situations they will face if they're fighting from their back along with dealing with strikes. According to popular mythology, a ghoul is an evil spirit that eats from graves. Imported from pre-Islamic Arab culture, the ghoul does not have a fixed appearance in popular imagination. However, many stories tell of their grisly deeds. Burke and Hare's story is a tale of real-life ghouls. I don't like assigning supernatural beings to real-life criminals. However, the ghoul is one exception. The creature is a disgusting parasite on humanity, and Burke and Hare certainly fit that description. However, there were plenty of others in their story that were also to blame. When the Westport murders were exposed, a type of grim, ironic poetry took place. There were plenty who bayed for blood and used the atrocities to justify acting like ghouls themselves. Akin to Burke and Hare, they no doubt self-justified their reasoning. They wanted to see a man killed, his body dissected, and to buy souvenirs from his corpse because it was justice. Yet where were any of these locals when these 16 murders took place? Where were the public house owners, regular patrons and shopkeepers when Burke and Hare regularly picked up their shots? Where were the morals of all those who saw a ready supply of fresh corpses finding their way into pack lectures? In the end, it was individuals such as Janet Brown who never gave up looking and inquiring for her friend and eventually identified her clothes and of course the greys that refused to be bribed and chose to blow the whistle on them despite being destitute themselves that set the example for humanity. Some of the biggest monsters we face are the cultures of apathy and denial. <laughs>